In this video, we'll do the same battle in D&D 5th edition and in Pathfinder 2nd edition, and afterward, examine the differences we see. This is the third video in my series of Pathfinder Law School courses. My personal preference is Pathfinder, but today's video is not about which system is better. It's more about learning the differences between the two systems to help people who are familiar with one to learn the other and also just to help sort out the differences in our heads. I am Ronald, the rules lawyer. I am a lawyer and activist who also, for several years, taught an after-school and middle school tabletop RPG class, and I hope my experience teaching and a decade of game mastering and being a lawyer provide a unique skill set that will make this video series useful. So like and subscribe if you want to be notified about future videos. For today's demonstration, we'll do a very well-known battle in a certain D&D adventure that there are many maps for on the internet if you look for it. It involves an ambush by four goblins. I'm going to be using the pre-generated characters. They consist of the classic four, the fighter, rogue, cleric, and wizard. I'll be using the characters in the D&D starter set and the Pathfinder beginner box. In both fights, there will be four goblins. And goblins are 50 XP each, and so according to the encounter building guidelines, this looks like it should be a medium encounter. However, because there are four of them, you multiply their strength by two, and therefore it is actually a deadly encounter which is the first experience of D&D for people playing this adventure. Four goblin warriors in Pathfinder make it a moderate encounter. Now, people familiar with both systems say that a moderate encounter in Pathfinder tends to be comparable to a deadly encounter in D&D 5e. Generally, that's true. Encounters generally are tuned to be a little more difficult in Pathfinder. However, since this is a level one party that we have and D&D &D level one parties are particularly fragile, the deadly moniker probably is accurate here. So here is that battle in both systems. D&D &D fifth edition is on the left and Pathfinder's second edition is on the right. The setup for this battle is that the party is traveling to a town by wagon and the road is blocked by dead horses that have arrows sticking out of them. There are four goblins lying in wait that are have set this up as an ambush spot. We already see the differences between the systems before initiative is even rolled. In D&D, the players say what they're doing. The wizard and the rogue go forward to examine the bodies, and the fighter and the cleric players are both saying they're looking out for danger. The dungeon master, as they're called in D&D, could ask what they're holding in their hands. However, that's not that necessary in 5th edition because during combat, you can still move and do your action and still also pull out your weapon. It's effectively a free action, but you only get one free object interaction. But that usually means you don't need to worry about whether you're having your weapon out beforehand. Things demand a little more precision in Pathfinder 2nd Edition because pulling out your weapon is one of your three actions. So it's good to establish whether you have your weapons out. Also, there are specific activities you are doing before combat begins. The players can still say in general terms what they're doing to the game master, and the GM can translate it to one of these activities. You're not necessarily exclusively doing these things you're saying, it's more what you're focusing and concentrating on. The player for the rogue says she is going to be searching the dead horses. The wizard is going to be using his deduction trying to recall knowledge about what he's seeing while investigating the horses. The fighter will be watching out for danger, his player says, and the GM interprets that as defending. His shield is going to be raised. Simply holding a shield does not increase your armor class in Pathfinder 2e. You need to spend an action on your turn to increase your AC by 2 until the start of your next turn. Defending now before battle begins means that he will get that AC bonus even before his first turn. The cleric is saying she's looking out for danger, and the GM translates that as scouting, giving a plus one circumstance bonus to everyone's initiative roll. 
The goblins then make their move and attack, and the game master asks all the players to roll for initiative. In D&D 5e, it is a dexterity check. In Pathfinder 2e, it depends. The default way to roll initiative is to roll your perception. So you act earlier in combat, not based on how fast you can react, but on how quickly you ascertain that you are in danger. But these exploration activities we just went through could change what check you make. The wizard player likely would be able to roll one of his knowledge skills like society or nature. The others would be rolling perception. While the goblins in 5e are also making dexterity checks, the goblins in Pathfinder are all going to be rolling stealth because they are all avoiding notice. So they have now rolled initiative and they have the same order in both battles. I unfortunately cannot do the dice rolling on the screen. I cannot have that randomness in this comparison video. I need to control the results and have them do generally the same dice rolls. One thing Pathfinder also accounts for is if they are hiding behind cover, which they are, they're hiding behind these trees and logs, that will give them a bonus to their stealth checks. That also is factored into their initiative rolls. Cover gives them a plus two circumstance bonus. That is how doing an ambush is reflected in Pathfinder. In D&D, what happens is there is a separate additional stealth check made to determine whether party members are surprised. The DM rolls on behalf of all the goblins. They have a stealth bonus of plus six, and in this case, they roll a total of 12. That number is compared to the perception DCs of the party members. And the perception DC is represented by the number next to the eyeball. So the fighter is not surprised. The wizard is not surprised. The cleric is not surprised. However, the rogue has only a 10 for her perception DC, so she will be surprised. Being surprised will deny the rogue the ability to act during the first round of combat, at least until the end of her first turn. Meanwhile, in Pathfinder, we will see this play out. Their stealth check for initiative will be compared to the perception DC of that character to see how well that character will perceive them, at least until that goblin does something to give itself away. The highest perception DC is that of the cleric, who has a 17. So these first two goblins, who have 25 and 18, are going to be unnoticed by the party. The party will not even know when initiative starts that they are there. In contrast, goblins 3 and 4 will be noticed by the party. Goblin 3 and Goblin 4, their locations are known to the party. They may not necessarily see these goblins, but they hear them and know where they are. As for resolving ties, the goblin and the rogue both had a 17 here. The DM can decide which acts first or can use random determination. In Pathfinder, if there is a tie, the monster goes before the players. Combat begins now. A creature in D&D can do a set of things on its turn. Each of it is its own possible thing you can check off. It can do an action, which could be attacking or casting a spell or many other things. It can also move up to its speed. It can also interact with an object or something in the environment. It can also do a bonus action. Not all creatures can use that bonus action part of their turn. They need a special ability. They can also do one reaction that could be during their turn or outside their turn. But as the name implies, it is usually in response to something else. The first to act is goblin number one, and it is hiding behind this log here. It will fire its short bow at the rogue. It rolls a d20 and adds its short bow bonus, which is plus four. The goblin is unseen by the rogue, so it is going to attack with advantage. Advantage means it makes its attack roll two times and keeps the higher result. Its attack roll is 16, and the rogue's armor class is 14, so this successfully hits the rogue. The short bow does 1d6 plus 2 damage. It does maximum damage, doing 8 damage to the rogue and bringing the rogue's hit points down from 9 to 1, so she is in danger. There is a nuance in the rules here. The goblin was unseen by the rogue, so therefore it had advantage when attacking the rogue. Hiding successfully also made the rogue surprised. Surprise is different. Being surprised on its own only means that she cannot act. 
if, for example, this goblin were hiding right here and instead of firing a bow, ran out and attacked with a short sword, then the goblin would become seen and not have advantage on its attack any longer. The rogue would still be surprised. All that being surprised does is that the rogue cannot act yet. So it's important to sort that out. Often, being unseen is how you surprise them in the first place. The goblin has done its action by attacking. It can move up to its speed in addition. It does not want to move from its current spot. This is a great spot to attack from. It can also interact with an object or something in the environment. It's not going to do that. It can also do a bonus action if it has an ability that uses a bonus action. And goblins do. Goblins have nimble escape. As a bonus action, they can disengage or hide. By attacking, the goblin revealed itself to the party. So it will try to hide again and become unseen again. So it does a stealth check. It rolls a stealth check of 16, which is higher than all of the passive perceptions of all the player characters. So it is unseen to all of them. Now we have goblin number one in Pathfinder. In Pathfinder, a creature on their turn has three actions that they can do. They also have one reaction that they can do even outside their turn. In Pathfinder, if you are benefiting from cover, and this goblin is by positioning itself behind the tree, you get a plus two circumstance bonus to your armor class. That works both ways in Pathfinder. If you draw an imaginary line from the center of this goblin's token to the rogue, it will pass through this cover. So therefore, the rogue will have a plus two circumstance bonus to her armor class. This increases the rogue's armor class from 18 to 20. However, we also know that this goblin is not seen by the rogue. It rolled a stealth check higher than the rogue's perception DC. The rogue is flat-footed, giving her a minus two circumstance penalty to her armor class. Circumstance bonuses and circumstance penalties can counteract each other. So this returns the rogue's armor class to 18. One thing I didn't mention for the D&D goblin was that its short bow's range is 80 feet, and beyond that range, it has disadvantage and can target something up to 320 feet away. If it had been farther than 80 feet away, which it was not, then it would have had disadvantage, which would have canceled out the advantage that it had. The goblin warrior is 65 feet away from the rogue. Had this been D&D, &D, this would have been 55 feet. What's going on here? Well, in Pathfinder, you count every second diagonal square as being 10 feet instead of 5 feet. If you were to draw the shape of a fireball in Pathfinder, it would be more round and not be a square. The short bow's range increment is 60 feet. If it is outside 60 feet, there will be a minus two range penalty to the attack roll. If the rogue were 60 feet farther away, say 125 feet away, it would be a minus four penalty. The penalty gets bigger and bigger. So as you can see, a number of modifiers can happen in a single roll, which can be overwhelming at first, though in my experience it's something people get used to, and if you're not tracking at all, and nobody's noticing, you're still having fun. The Goblin Warrior's short bow has a plus eight to attack, and the range penalty makes that a plus six. The Goblin rolls a total of 18, which is enough to hit the Rogue. This Goblin also rolls maximum damage. However, that takes away only six of this Rogue's 15 hit points. The Goblin has two more actions. It will now fire again. In Pathfinder, you can attack more than once. This is true of all creatures in the game. However, the second attack will be less accurate than the first, and the third and subsequent attacks are less accurate than the second. This is called the multiple attack penalty. The second attack will have a minus five penalty to it. So this goblin will roll with only a plus one to its bonus this time. However, the goblin, by making its first attack, revealed itself and made itself observed, so therefore seen by all the player characters. So the rogue is no longer flat-footed to it, and it is less accurate. 
This last attack is now a plus one to try to hit an armor class of 20 and misses unsurprisingly. The goblin still has another action. Attacking again will almost certainly not hit. So what it will do is use its third action to hide behind the tree and do a stealth check. This works just like in D&D, but it will get a plus two circumstance bonus from the tree itself. Its total is 17, which succeeds at hiding from all of the players. Note that it did not have a special bonus action to be able to do this, and any creature has three actions and could have done this exact sequence of things if they had a ranged attack. It's now the fighter's turn, and the fighter is not surprised, so he can act. Because the goblin's stealth check did not beat the fighter's passive perception, the fighter can see all of them. He wants to protect his allies from harm in case they run up to them. So he's going to take out his great axe and he's going to use his action to ready an attack against any creature that enters his reach. Ready is a special action that lets you act even in the middle of another creature's turn. You have to define a trigger and your response to the trigger. If a goblin charges up, he can interrupt the goblin's turn with an attack with his great axe and that would use his reaction. So it uses both his action and his reaction. Now we have the Pathfinder fighter. Because his turn starts, his raised shield stops being raised. Goblin Warrior 2 has not acted yet, and its stealth initiative check was higher than the fighter's perception DC. So therefore, when I click the fighter, it actually does not notice the goblin, and it does not detect that it is right here. Goblins 3 and 4 had stealth checks that were lower, so therefore the fighter detects them. However, this GM will extrapolate from the sneak action rules in Pathfinder and say that because they did not critically fail, they did not get stealth checks that were at least 10 lower than the fighter's perception DC, they are still benefiting from being hidden to the fighter. As you can tell, there are definite gradations of stealth in Pathfinder. Being undetected means that the fighter does not know that this goblin number two is in the square. Goblins three and four are hidden to the fighter. The fighter knows where they are, but he cannot actually directly observe them. Maybe they made a noise that gave away their location. If they had yet lower stealth checks, they would be observed. To do the same thing the D&D fighter did, readying an action would cost this fighter two actions. It generally works the same as in D&D. However, it also would end this fighter's turn immediately. He's not going to do that. He's going to do something that is available in Pathfinder, but not in D&D. He is going to delay. It is something he can do when his turn begins. It takes him out of the initiative order. He can re-enter the initiative after another creature finishes their turn. He cannot interrupt another creature's turn. He would have to enter after they're done. However, this preserves for him the ability to do all three of his actions when he re-enters initiative. Whenever he returns to initiative, he will stay in his new spot in the initiative order. However, he's unable to take any actions, including reactions, until he stops delaying. Goblin number two will shoot at this fighter. Because the fighter can see him, he does not have advantage. The goblin rolls an 18 making a total attack roll of 22, which does hit the fighter's armor class. This short bow does five damage, reducing the fighter to seven. This goblin can also choose to hide behind this tree. However, the tactical considerations are different in D&D. All of these foes could use their speed to go up to it and do all of their actions, their one action, unload all their full offensive power against it. Similarly, this goblin can move away in order to increase the distance between itself and the enemy. And it's going to use its 30 foot speed to move away. I'm going to make this foliage difficult terrain, so it's going to move there. In Pathfinder, the same goblin is still unnoticed and undetected by the fighter. So the fighter is going to be flat footed to this upcoming shortbow attack. The goblin can spend its first action to lean out, so it kind of in between these squares here, let's imagine that, to negate the cover bonus to the fighter. So the goblin only needs to hit a 16 with this short bow attack. On the d20 roll, the goblin rolls an 18, giving it a total attack of 26. That makes it a critical hit. 
In D&D, critical hits happen when you roll a 20 on your die roll. But they can happen in Pathfinder if your total attack roll is at least 10 higher than the armor class you're targeting. So because of that, it gets a critical hit. With a critical hit in D&D, you double the number of dice you roll. Any flat bonus to your damage remains the same. But in Pathfinder, you double the entire result, including the flat bonus. So critical hits are deadlier in Pathfinder. In addition, weapons have special traits. And the shortbow has the deadly d10 trait, which means that on a critical hit, you also roll a d10 on top of all of that and add that to the total. So this does a whopping 12 damage, lowering the fighter from 20 to 8 hit points. Doing that revealed the goblin. The goblin can use its third action to try to move away. That would not clear it from the fighter trying to run up to it, however, because the fighter could spend his first two actions chasing him and making an attack. Because remember, Pathfinder characters can do three actions on their turn. So instead, this goblin warrior will make a second attack with the multiple attack penalty. So the goblin makes another attack at a plus three bonus, and that attack misses. Well, at this, the fighter decides to re-enter initiative. He has a speed of 25 feet, so he can move, or stride is the name of the action in Pathfinder, to move here to close in to the goblin. He does so. He has his sword and his shield in hand. He's going to swing that sword. Being a fighter in Pathfinder, he is more accurate than even other martial characters, so he has a plus nine to his attack roll. He rolls low, however. He only rolls a five on his die. A 14 total will miss the goblin's armor class of 16. That's too bad. If he had succeeded at killing the goblin now, he would then be able to use his third action to walk up and threaten this next goblin. He now has a few options. Will he swing again, but with a lower accuracy? Or will he raise a shield to give him that plus two circumstance bonus to his armor class? In theory, he does not have to spend that action to raise his shield, because as a fighter, his level one special fighter feat is called Reactive Shield. It lets him, as a reaction in response to an attack against him, raise his shield and apply the bonus of his shield to the triggering attack. The problem with that, however, is that it uses his reaction to do that, and as a fighter, he has two powerful reactions that he may want to save that reaction for instead. He's thinking to himself that he just got critically hit and he does not want to be knocked out. So he's going to raise his shield now. Not only does it raise his armor class, but as a fighter, he has the shield block reaction. If an enemy gets past that increased armor class and hits him, he can lower the incoming damage by blocking it with the shield. Now to Goblin 3. This goblin is going to do the dash action. Instead of moving up to its speed and doing, let's say, an attack as its action, it will use its action to double how far it can move. So it can move now 60 feet. So that enables it to go through this difficult terrain and move here. However, our fighter had readied an action to attack a goblin entering his reach. So he makes that attack now, but he rolls only a five and his total of 10 will not hit the goblin's AC of 15. This goblin is very courageous because there are some reasons to do this. By engaging them in melee, it limits the choices for these characters in D&D because any character that tries to move away will provoke an opportunity attack from the goblin. They can avoid it with the disengage action, but that would cost them their action. This goblin's turn now ends. It cannot attack because it used its action to dash, and his bonus action is not useful right now. This goblin warrior will also move twice its speed. However, it simply requires that it use two actions, two stride actions to do so. So through the difficult terrain, it manages to get right here. Because its buddy is on the opposite side of the fighter, they are flanking the fighter. This makes the fighter flat-footed. It has a minus two circumstance penalty to his AC, which is now 
18. This goblin was holding both his short bow and his short sword, called a dog slicer in Pathfinder. He swings that dog slicer now. His 22 hits the fighter, and the goblin rolls 4 damage. The fighter, because his shield is raised, uses his shield block reaction. Because his wooden shield has a hardness of 3, the incoming damage of 4 is reduced by that number to 1. That remaining 1 damage is applied both to the shield and to the fighter. So the shield loses 1 hit point, and the fighter loses 1 hit point. If the shield ever goes down to half of its health, then it becomes broken. We now go to this rogue in D&D. Because her passive perception was only 10, she is surprised. Only after this turn is she able to act, including using her reaction. In Pathfinder, there is no surprise mechanic. It's also worth noting that perception is not a skill in Pathfinder. It's its own thing. Every creature is proficient in perception, at least trained, sometimes even better. This rogue was focused on searching the bodies. However, the player established with the GM that while adventuring, she's carrying her rapier in one hand and a dagger in the other. She's going to walk up. As an elf, she has a native 30-foot speed, which is faster than the usual 25-foot speed in Pathfinder. So she's able to get to this spot. So now she is flanking the goblin, and the goblin is flat-footed to her. For a rogue, making an enemy flat-footed is important not only because it makes them easier to hit, but also because she can sneak attack them. If she hits a flat-footed enemy, she gets to add 1d6 precision damage to her damage. She's going to swing with her rapier. Her 12 does not hit the goblin. She then uses her third action to make another attack. However, not with her rapier, because her offhand weapon, her dagger, has the agile trait. So instead of having a minus five penalty when it is your second attack, it is only a minus four penalty. She misses with this as well. The dice are not treating this party very well. If she had hit with the rapier, it would have done sneak attack damage. And then if she followed it up and hit with the dagger, it also would do sneak attack damage. The limitation of doing sneak attack damage once per turn in D&D does not exist in Pathfinder. Also, there's a number of ways, many ways, to make an enemy flat-footed to you. You can be invisible. You can do a skill check like a feint with your deception skill to make them flat-footed to you. I did a video where I sing about all the ways you can make something flat-footed. There's a link in the video description. Next up is the cleric. As a cleric, the cleric chooses three cantrips at character creation that are minor spells that he can cast at will as many times as he wants to. He also can cast first level spells, and two of those spells are always prepared for him in the morning, Bless and Cure Wounds, due to him being a life domain cleric. He additionally can prepare four more spells. Those are going to be Command, Guiding Bolt, Healing Word, and Shield of Faith. He has six first level spells prepared, however he only has two spell slots or castings. He's going to use one of them now because this looks to be a tough battle. He is going to cast the Bless spell. He can bless up to three creatures and they are going to be himself, the fighter, and the rogue. They, whenever they make an attack roll or saving throw, get to add 1d4 to their check. He will stay in the back in order to stay away from danger, and that ends his turn. He has no bonus action to do. Our Pathfinder Cleric gets to prepare five cantrips in the morning, and gets to change which ones they are every morning. She also has two first level spell slots. She is a prepared spellcaster. Pathfinder 2e uses what's called Vancean spellcasting. It is how D&D used to do spellcasting. She gets to prepare two spells, they are Bless and Sanctuary, and when she casts that spell, it is crossed off of her spell list. In addition, she has a Divine Font, an extra number of spells that either give life or take away life. She does positive magic with her Divine Font, so she has extra castings of the Heal spell. She is going to cast the Bless spell. Bless works differently in Pathfinder. It creates a five-foot aura around her. Ooh. And she and her allies within that aura get a plus one status bonus to their attack rolls. It is a smaller bonus. However, 
every plus one is effectively a plus two in Pathfinder because of the way critical hits work. It increases their chance to critically hit as well. Bless used two actions represented by this two action symbol, leaving her with one action left. You may notice that I moved the clerics, I needed two for this demonstration, but the cleric after casting the Bless spell is going to move to this spot. And this will benefit both the fighter and the rogue with the Bless aura. And Bless is now crossed off of her prepared first level spells. Next is goblin number four. In D&D, it's going to move 20 feet to, toward the fighter and attack the fighter. And it rolls a natural 20 on the die. This will do critical hit damage. It's going to roll damage dice twice. This does nine damage, and that's going to knock out the fighter and make him unconscious. He's going to fall prone, drop everything he's holding. Now, because the fighter has a maximum health of 12, if the goblin had hit the fighter so hard that it brought the fighter to negative 12, which this goblin probably couldn't have done, then it would have instantly killed the fighter because of the massive damage rule in D&D. Now, if the goblin had aimed at the rogue next to the fighter and had rolled just one more point of damage, 10 damage, it would have instantly killed the rogue because the rogue would have gone to negative nine. So as you can see, low levels are pretty deadly in D&D, &D, especially level one. Then it's going to move again. It can break up its movement with its other actions. So it's going to move 10 feet down here and threaten the wizard. I'm going to note that all creatures have opportunity attacks, including this rogue. She can use a reaction to attack only if a creature moves out of her reach. And because this goblin stayed within her reach, she cannot make an opportunity attack. Next is this goblin warrior who was wielding a short bow. He is going to drop the short bow, which is a free action, and use his first action to take out his dog slicer. Then he is going to move right here. And he's moving through a square, this one, and the fighter can make an attack of opportunity because in Pathfinder, attack of opportunity triggers on a lot more things, including simply leaving a square that you threaten. However, we'll remember that this fighter already used his reaction to shield block against this goblin's attack. The fighter actually has three abilities that all compete for his reaction and gives him some strategic choices and he wanted to prioritize defense on this turn. Also his moving here triggers a reaction from Goblin 3. Goblins have a signature ability in Pathfinder also and that is Goblin Scuttle. When an ally ends a move action adjacent to it, it can step. And step is a special action to move one square without provoking reactions like attack of opportunity. This allows Goblin 4 to flank the fighter, lowering his AC to 18. But we'll remember that the D&D Goblin rolled a 20, so this one will roll a 20 on its roll also. And I'm actually going to roll this damage to show something. Oh, okay, it rolls six, and there's an extra plus one damage being added from the backstabber trait of the weapon. Dog slicers have the backstabber trait. When they hit something that's flat-footed, they add this extra damage. And we double that total on a crit. So that's 14 damage to the fighter. Instant death from massive damage works differently in Pathfinder. A single blow needs to do double their maximum hit points. So 40 hit points in this case, which as you can tell is a harder condition to meet than in D&D, &D. but it can be dangerous still. There are creatures that do a lot more damage than these goblins, and not all PCs will have 20 hit points at level one. So he will go down to zero hit points, fall prone, and get the dying two condition because it was a critical hit. You die at dying four in Pathfinder, and he normally being knocked out puts you at dying one, but a critical hit or critically failing on a, your own saving throw will put you straight to dying two. We'll see how the dying condition works later. He drops everything he held, moves to right before the effect that knocked him out. So right here. 
That gives his whole party a whole round to help him before he has to do a check to not die. Next is our wizard. The wizard gets to learn four cantrips at the start of his career and these are permanent choices for him. He also has a spell book. Unlike the cleric, he is limited to several spells in his spell book instead of the entire spell list for his class. He also gets to prepare four spells, but he doesn't get the bonus spells that the cleric gets. He has prepared shield, sleep, magic missile, and burning hands. He wants to attack these goblins, so he's going to cast Ray of Frost, which is a ranged spell attack because it is a ranged attack, he has disadvantage with his attack roll if he were to do that against this goblin because there is an enemy adjacent to the wizard. When you have someone bearing down on you, it's hard to be precise with your ranged attacks. So instead, he's going to cast Burning Hands. He's going to aim a 15-foot cone towards these goblins, and he rolls 10 damage from his 3d6 roll. The goblins do dexterity saves to avoid the damage, and they need to have a 13 or higher in order to take only half damage. Goblin 3 fails his saving throw and takes the full amount, killing him. Goblin 4 rolls a natural 20, and that definitely succeeds, and so he takes only half damage, bringing him down from 7 to 2 health. The wizard would like to move away, but that would provoke an opportunity attack from the goblin. So he finishes his turn. Our Pathfinder wizard, like the Pathfinder cleric, gets to prepare five cantrips in the morning and can change them from day to day. He also has a limited spell book to choose spells from, and he can prepare only two first level spells for the day, and they are going to be Burning Hands and Magic Missile. Now he has a cantrip that attacks as well, and I just want to use a parallel situation here. What if he were right next to the goblin? He could cast Acid Splash, and there would be no penalty doing a ranged attack roll in melee. You don't want to do a ranged attack if they have attack of opportunity because that would trigger an attack of opportunity in Pathfinder, but most creatures don't have that in Pathfinder. Acid Splash would also actually splash on all adjacent creatures, so that would harm our fighter if the wizard were to aim it at this goblin. And increase his dying value. So instead, our wizard is going to spend one of his spell slots. He's going to cast Burning Hands. In Pathfinder, when using a grid, the rules as written are specific on how you can aim your spell. And when you aim it diagonally, it has to be from a corner. And he does not want to harm the fighter. That would bring him closer to death. So he's going to move right here and aim his cone like so and hit those two goblins only. That's cool. The goblins, however, benefit from cover from this tree. Cover provides a plus two circumstance bonus to your reflex saves against area effects. The Pathfinder version of the spell is more modest. It does 2d6 damage, and it does seven damage. Goblin three therefore has a plus nine on this saving throw and needs to beat a 17. It fails, so it's going to take the full 7 damage. These goblins only have 6 hit points. This is a dead goblin. Goblin 2 rolls a natural 20, and therefore critically succeeds on a saving throw. When a spell calls for a basic save, like Burning Hands, that is shorthand for a successful save doing half damage, but also a critical success on your save makes it do zero damage. Also, critically failing the save, like rolling a one, will make you take double damage. So this goblin is unscathed. So the wizard player crosses that spell off of his list. We now enter round two. Goblin number one, which has been hiding behind this faraway tree, is now going to fire. It sees that the rogue could be taken down. The goblin had succeeded in hiding against its perception DC of only 10, so it's going to have advantage on this attack. It rolls an 18 on the die, and the total of 22 is definitely going to hit the rogue. The rogue takes 5 damage, and thankfully that does not bring it down to negative 9, 
which under the mass of damage rule would have killed the rogue. So she goes down and is unconscious, and she does not move in the initiative order under 5e e rules. The goblin has its bonus action and will try to hide. And this is a low roll and it fails to hide this time. The Pathfinder goblin had successfully hid behind this tree as well. It's going to take aim at the rogue. Here the high check succeeds at making the rogue flat-footed, lowering her AC to 16. The goblin rolls 18 for a total of 24. Remember the range penalty is applying a minus two penalty to its attack roll. Had there been no range penalty, it would have been a critical hit. So the rogue was a little lucky this time. This bow does five damage. But our goblin has two more actions. It does not fire again right now. It's going to try to become hidden again for its second attack. So it uses its second action to hide, does a stealth check with the plus two bonus provided by the tree, and succeeds again against the rogue. So it will make a second attack against a lowered AC. This is another good roll doing five more damage to the rogue, which knocks out the rogue and puts her at dying one and makes her fall prone. Also, she moves in the initiative to right before the goblin warrior. Here on the left, the fighter needs to do a death saving throw because he did not move in initiative when he was knocked out. A death saving throw consists simply of rolling a d20 die, and if your roll is 10 or higher, you succeed and get one success. When you get three successes, you stabilize and no longer have to make death saving throws. On the other hand, if you have three failures, your character dies. If you roll a natural one, that counts as two failures. If you roll a natural 20, you immediately stabilize, gain one hit point, and can do your turn. Here the fighter fails, and so he gets one failure. We now go to Goblin 2, who decides to go behind this tree that we will say is right here, and uses his bonus action to hide behind it to set up an attack. And he succeeds with that roll. He now makes an attack against the wizard with advantage. This roll hits and inflicts five damage on the wizard. And this party is in danger. Notice how because of the goblin's bonus action, a DM is incentivized if playing optimally to make goblins into ranged skirmishers increasing the distance between themselves and their foes. Here, the Pathfinder fighter did not have to make such a save because he had moved later in the initiative when he was knocked out. Here, Goblin number two feels a little more confident now that two enemies are knocked out and decides to switch to melee. He drops his bow, takes an action to take out his dog slicer, then walks up to the cleric right here and with his third action attacks the cleric. He hits the cleric and inflicts three damage to the cleric. In D&D, the rogue's place in the initiative calls for her to make a death saving throw now. She succeeds on her roll and is closer to recovering. Also, if you take damage while you were knocked out, that counts as a failure for you and a critical hit makes you take two failures. Next is the D&D cleric. He is going to cast the very effective spell called Healing Word. He only has one first level spell slot for the day. Healing Word is a bonus action spell, so he still can do his main action. After casting this, a creature within 60 feet of his choice gets 1d4 plus his spell casting modifier, Wisdom in this case, hit points back. Also, because he's a life domain cleric, he gets to add three to the amount he heals. So this restores eight hit points to the rogue, and he still has his main action. For teaching purposes, let's assume he has another spell slot now, and he wants to cast Shield of Faith, which would increase his armor class for the duration. There are a number of reasons he cannot do that. First, you cannot cast more than one spell on your turn. There is an exception to that rule, which I'll go into momentarily. Second, it is a concentration spell, and in D&D, spells that require concentration that have that marked out in their description, you can only maintain one of them at a time. Because Bless is a concentration spell, if he were to cast Shield of Faith now, it would end the Bless spell immediately. Also, readying a spell uses your concentration, even if that spell that you're readying does not normally require concentration. Another problem is that Shield of Faith requires your bonus action. He already used his bonus action to heal the rogue with Healing Word. 
And in D&D, you cannot use your action to do something that asks for a bonus action. So he cannot cast a second spell on his turn, right? So he's got to do something else. Not true. There's one exception, which is if the spell he is using his main action for is a cantrip. And in this case, he wants to cast the Sacred Flame cantrip and attack Goblin number three with it. Goblin number three fails its saving throw and takes four radiant damage, and that kills the goblin. The cleric says he's done with his turn. He doesn't want to move. Now it is the Pathfinder cleric's turn, and she has many options with her three actions. She's concerned about the threat posed by these three goblins, one of them being off screen, and also her two allies being down. An option is to cast the heal spell. She can cast it three times today, and when she casts it, there are three different versions of it that depend on how many actions you spend on it. One action can heal something at the range of touch and heals them 1d8 hit points. Two actions heal something up to 30 feet away and adds eight to the amount you heal them. The three action version is an AoE effect that can heal every living creature within 30 feet and you can include yourself because it's an emanation. But it does not benefit from the extra eight hit points of healing. But she decides to do something else. She's going to spend two actions to heal the fighter. This succeeds at giving the fighter 12 hit points back because of that bonus healing. The fighter loses the dying condition, but also gains the wounded one condition. This is something that makes Pathfinder different from D&D. The wounded value makes it more dangerous if the fighter were to be knocked out again because let's say the goblin brings him down to zero hit points again, he would normally go to dying one. But because he is wounded, he adds the value of the wounded condition to his dying condition. So if we were to get knocked out again, he would go straight to dying two. If his knockout were the result of a critical hit by an enemy or him critically failing a saving throw, he would go straight to dying three. And if he were to be healed again, his wounded value would tick up one to wounded two. So as you can see, it gets more and more dangerous. He gets closer to death even after coming back up from unconsciousness. So that is the reason why the cleric spent two actions to heal the fighter, so that it wouldn't be as easy to knock him out again. Also, the fighter has some advantages fighting on his own versus the rogue. Her hope is that bringing this fighter to his feet can swing this battle back in the party's favor again. With her third action, she could cast heal again on the rogue, the one action version, which would make the rogue conscious. However, that does cost another spell slot, and there's something else that is cool that she would like to do. And it's inherent to the Bless spell. She can use an action to expand the aura of Bless by five feet, and she does so. If she has enough time, she can make it fill the entire battlefield. She had other combinations, healing both of them with one action heals and expanding her Bless spell. As you can see, the three action economy offers more choices because everything is competing for the same resource, and there's different combinations that are possible. In contrast, the Healing Word spell for the D&D Cleric was not competing for any other action from the Cleric, which also makes that spell much more useful. Next is the Pathfinder Fighter, and we remember that his initiative changed, so he acts now. We see another reason why you don't want to get knocked out in Pathfinder. In 5e, when you are knocked out, you can stand up at the cost of half your movement speed and pick up your weapon for free during your turn. However, doing those things will cost the fighter two of his three actions. Standing is an action, picking up his sword is an action, and also if he wants to return to the state he was at with a sword and shield before, he will have to spend a third action to pick up his shield. So what he does is instead he's going to stand up, action one, he's going to pick up his shield, and instead of raising his shield, he's actually going to try to hit the goblin with it. You can bash with your shield in Pathfinder. He also benefits from the Bless spell, so he's going to have this monstrous plus 10 attack bonus against the goblin, but unfortunately it misses. Also, I want this demonstration to drag out longer so I can show more things. Now, why did he pick up his shield? Well, he has the reactive shield feat. If something attacks him, he can, as a reaction, raise his shield, increase his AC by two. So picking up the shield instead of the sword gives him some more defense. Next is Goblin 4, and what it will do is attack the wizard. 
it swings its short sword and misses, and it's going to use its special bonus action to disengage, which allows it to move away from an enemy without provoking opportunity attacks. So it's going to move here. Now these goblins are pretty unique in 5e. They have an ability that is similar to the rogue's cunning action ability that they get at second level. That means this combat is a bit unusual for the amount of moving around the battlefield that is going on and enemies hiding. Had the goblin not had that ability, it would have had to choose between attacking the wizard or disengaging. Goblin number four is next. Now it could just act in a straightforward manner, just attack the fighter multiple times, but it wants to set up a really good attack. It's going to try to distract the fighter because the way the math works out and critical hits in Pathfinder, it will make it much more likely that it will critically hit the fighter. So what it does is it creates a diversion. There are two ways to create a diversion. You can say something that distracts your enemy, or you can make a gesture or do some kind of physical trick. Saying something distracting has the linguistic trait, and that is a defined trait in Pathfinder, meaning that for it to work, you have to share a language with the enemy. This goblin knows that it doesn't share a language with these long shanks, as goblins in the Pathfinder world call tall people. So instead, it's going to point somewhere behind the fighter. This action has the manipulate trait, which is one of the triggers for attack of opportunity. Our fighter has a choice here. Does he want to attack this goblin now or save his reaction for defense? He decides not to attack the goblin. The goblin succeeds on his diversion, and that makes the fighter flat-footed to this upcoming attack. Then the goblin, as a second action, is going to attack. And this is a very high roll. It is a 23. That, unfortunately, is too high for the fighter to raise his shield against. Even raising his shield would not change the result. This attack goes through, and because it is a backstabber weapon, it does an extra damage. It does four damage. I will note here that this create a diversion action is something that the rogue could do, if it were conscious, to make somebody flat-footed and get sneak attack damage against them. For the goblin's third action, it's going to dart this direction in order to get closer to its archer friend. When it leaves the square, our fighter decides to go after it this time because leaving a square in Pathfinder can provoke an attack of opportunity. The fighter attacks with his shield and the fighter misses again and the goblin moves over here. Attacks of opportunity provoke on somebody moving out of a square you threaten, somebody doing a move action within your reach, so somebody standing up, somebody doing a ranged attack within your reach, or somebody doing a manipulate action, interacting with something. And many spells do the last thing. And also those actions that have the manipulate trait, they actually get disrupted if you critically succeed on your attack of opportunity. Next is the D&D wizard who has one first level slot left, and he can use it again to cast any of his prepared spells. He can cast the sleep spell, which has a fair chance of knocking out both of these goblins over here towards the east. But he decides to conserve that spell slot because he wants to protect himself and have the opportunity to cast shield. A very powerful defensive spell increases his AC by five after knowing an attacker's roll against him and the bonus persists until his next turn. So to conserve his slots, he's going to cast a cantrip. He's going to cast Ray of Frost. The Ray of Frost, it hits its mark, and it does four damage to the goblin, and he goes down dead. The wizard has not moved yet, so he decides to move here to get cover behind the wagon against both goblins. As you can see, spellcasting in 5e gives you more flexibility and therefore power to be able to choose from all the spells you prepared that day using your finite number of slots. Less advanced planning and prediction is required. It also adds some more complexity when spell slots become dry because of the greater number of things that you can do with those slots. In contrast, our Pathfinder wizard has one first level spell prepared magic missile, and that is all he can cast of his leveled spells. Now there's a class feature that lets him, in the spur of the moment, recast Burning Hands right now that can only be used once per day. So that's some compensation. Now does he want to cast Magic Missile? Well, let's look at Magic Missile. Magic Missile has three versions as well. The number of actions you spend casting it 
is the number of missiles, each doing 1d4 plus 1 damage, that you can let loose. It has an excellent range of 120 feet, so it can reach this pesky goblin warrior behind the tree. All the better, because magic missile automatically hits its target, so he won't need to do an attack roll, and the goblin warrior's cover will do him no good. He could spend all three missiles on this goblin to pretty much guarantee he'll be knocked out, or he can spread them out among more goblins to try to have a greater net effect. Another problem is that the three action version uses all of his actions. He might want to do something else. He is wary that this goblin behind the tree is going to shoot at him, so he could cast the shield spell which takes one action to give him a plus one circumstance bonus to AC until the start of his next turn. This is clearly weaker than the 5th edition version of Shield. However, this is a cantrip. He can cast it every round if he so chooses. And it also has this extra ability. It gives him a shield block reaction like the fighter does, which blocks five hit points of incoming damage However, it immediately ends the spell and he cannot cast shield for the next 10 minutes. So it's a good defensive move that can prevent him from being knocked out. So he'd like to cast shield. Now what to do with his other two actions? He has a cantrip that is quite powerful called Electric Arc that lets him attack two foes who are within 30 feet of him. He does so and they have to make saving throws. And there's the cool animation. <laughs> this cantrip does a 5 electricity damage, and they get to make basic saving throws. Here, Goblin number 2 fails at a saving throw and takes the full damage, and Goblin number 4 succeeds and takes half damage. We're now in round 3, and the Pathfinder Rogue actually is going to be next because she moved in initiative. She's at dying 1, so she's going to make her flat check now. If she succeeds, she will stabilize and get the wounded condition. However, she rolls a 1, which is a critical failure. You can critically fail and critically succeed on most checks in Pathfinder. This means that her dying value will increase by 2. So she goes to dying 3. When she saw the 1, there is something she could have done. At the beginning of the session of Pathfinder, every player has 1 hero point, and they can earn more hero points through good roleplay, heroism, or creative ideas. Hero points are used to re-roll a check, a d20 roll that you make. She can do this now to prevent the critical failure. However, she keeps that hero point in reserve because of the second reason you can use hero points, which is when your dying value would increase, you can prevent that from happening by spending all of the hero points you have to stabilize immediately and not increase your wounded value. So she decides to save her hero point for that. Now here in D&D, goblin number one is next and it's going to use its bonus action to hide and it succeeds on its stealth check. This is very bad. Although the wizard now has cover and his AC has increased from 12 to 14, the goblin has advantage. And this very high roll means that casting shield right now would actually not turn it into a miss. So this does four damage and knocks out the wizard. The Pathfinder Goblin will do something similar. It's going to try to hide now to be hidden from its target. It succeeds on the, this stealth check that used one action. With its next action, it will lean out to negate the cover bonus to the wizard's AC. The wizard still benefits from shield, which gives a plus one circumstance bonus, so his AC would be 16 now. However, he is now flat-footed because the goblin successfully hid. So only needs to hit a 14 right now, which is not that good for level one in Pathfinder. The range penalty means that the goblin's attack bonus is lowered to plus six. This dramatizes the importance of buffing and debuffing. If you work out the math, it has increased its chance of landing a critical hit from 5% to 15%. And this is a critical hit. The short bow has the deadly D10 trait that's going to be 12 damage against the wizard. The wizard elects to use the shield block reaction of his shield now, and that's going to reduce that to 7 damage. And also end the shield spell. That whole sequence setting up his attack took his whole turn, so that goblin's done. In D&D, our fighter is still unconscious, so does a death save now. He rolls 10 or higher, so he now has one success and one failure. 
Goblin 2 is going to do what Goblin 1 did, it will try to hide. This stealth check is unsuccessful, however, versus this rogue's passive perception, so we'll fire at the rogue without advantage. This is a miss. The goblin decides not to do anything else because it has now used its action and bonus action and does not want to move from this space. Next is Pathfinder Goblin number two. It has seen the fighter do attack of opportunity against retreating foes. It is still going to use its three actions to go in, make a strike, and then leave, however, because the fighter has already used his reaction using attack of opportunity against its buddy. Since he knows that, he feels pretty safe going right here and then making this strike, which does hit. Theoretically, the fighter could use his reactive shield feat to actually make this a miss. However, he already used his reaction. This does three damage to the fighter, and the goblin's last action is to move here. In D&D, we have our rogue here who would like to inflict sneak attack damage against one of these goblins. To get sneak attack damage as a D&D rogue, you need to either have advantage in your attack roll, or you need an ally of yours to be threatening that creature, so long as you don't have disadvantage on your attack. So the player says she's going to switch to her short bow. She's going to drop the short sword that she had been holding and take out her short bow. Remember, you can interact with one object for free on your turn. Dropping something, however, is free. Her action is going to be to shoot at this goblin. The goblin benefits from cover, and we remember she is benefiting from the bless spell, so she adds a d4 to her attack roll. The rogue rolls a 1 on her d20 roll. Rolling a natural 1 always misses, by the way. However, as a halfling, she has the lucky racial feature, which lets her always re-roll any one that she rolls. She rolls again, and she hits. For her short bow damage, she rolls a six-sided die. She only rolls a three. However, in D&D, because it is a dexterity attack, she is going to add her dexterity to her damage as well. So this six damage is nearly enough to knock out the goblin. The rogue would now like to hide somewhere and go behind cover. However, her short sword is on the ground there. She had dropped it. She could have stowed it away. However, that would have been an interaction. And putting one weapon away and taking out a second weapon would have meant using her action on her turn to do the use an object action and would have meant she would not be able to do an attack. Also, she cannot use her bonus action to pick up the sword, because by rule, something has to use your bonus action for you to be able to use it with your bonus action. Now to our D&D cleric, who has two downed allies, the fighter and the wizard. He has one first level spell slot left. It's pretty clear that he should cast Healing Word here, and he's going to do that to the wizard. This restores eight hit points to the wizard. That was his bonus action. So what he does now is he moves 25 feet, he's a dwarf so he's slower than other characters, to try to get closer to this goblin. Then he's going to interact with an object to draw out his hand axe and then throw it at the goblin. This being a thrown weapon, he is going to use his strength modifier instead of his dexterity modifier to his attack roll and damage. He also will benefit from that bless spell from earlier. And this is a hit. This succeeds at downing this goblin. So we just saw the cleric do four things on his turn. Cast healing word, move his speed, pull out a weapon, and attack with it. Sometimes you can do more things on your turn than in the three action economy. But also there are other turns where you're doing three things or two things, sometimes even just one thing out of your possible actions because of the action types that are involved. Here our Pathfinder cleric has a downed ally. She considers casting one of her heal spells to bring the rogue up, but she decides not to. She has another idea. She is wielding a scimitar and can hit with it. She is a war priest, which is one of the two subclasses you can choose for the cleric and pathfinder. This is the more martial focused one. So she can wear armor and during this fight, she has been wielding both a scimitar and a shield. And you may be wondering, how is it that she's able to cast spells without a free hand. You only need a free hand to cast spells in Pathfinder if it uses a material 
component or focus component, and none of the spells she has cast so far requires either of those. Being a war priest also gives her some other advantages, but we won't go into that. But she basically wants to get in the front lines. She's going to walk right here, and she's going to swing that scimitar. She's not as accurate as the fighter. She has a plus five bonus. However, the blessed spell makes it a plus six. So she swings at goblin number four. And this is a hit, and it does five damage, killing the goblin. And she did not heal the rogue because she wanted to do this. She wanted to have an action left to make a second attack. She swings at the goblin warrior. The scimitar has a couple of weapon traits that distinguish it mechanically from other weapons. Pathfinder weapons have traits that make them more distinct. The first trait is the sweep trait. If she attacked another creature earlier this turn with that weapon, which she did, she gets a plus one circumstance bonus to this attack roll, which stacks with the plus one status bonus from her bless spell. She still suffers from the multiple attack penalty. This all ends up being a plus two on her attack roll. Another trait that the scimitar has is the forceful trait. Basically, it gains momentum. It does more damage as you make multiple attacks. If she can land this blow, she's going to get an additional amount of damage equal to the number of damage dice. And as you get to higher levels, you can have up to four damage dice, and that bonus doubles if she's under her full multiple attack penalty, making a third or fourth strike. Lots of explanation, but it's a miss. We're going to keep this goblin alive to show more stuff. Next is the Pathfinder fighter, who is holding a shield in hand and sees these two goblins. He could pick up his sword, but that's going to cost a whole action. So he decides to do a couple of things at once. He's going to take out his short bow. Then he's going to move right here next to the cleric so that he's within the bless aura. He's taking out his short bow he, because he wants to threaten this goblin who has been a thorn in the party side and also have a way to attack this goblin if it should run away. He could attack this goblin right now, but he also knows that if the goblin tries to run away without stepping away first at least, then he'll get to do an attack of opportunity to kick the goblin. So he makes this attack. The goblin benefits from cover, so he needs an 18 on this roll. Before firing, he releases the shield as a free action, and then he fires the bow, and it misses. So that ends the fighter's turn. Now our D&D wizard is going to stand up, which costs half of his movement. Then for his action, he is going to use that last spell slot. He can see the goblin, and so can cast a magic missile. He decides to cast something else. He's going to cast Sleep. It affects a 20-foot burst and causes 5d8 hit points of creatures to fall asleep without a saving throw. This has the advantage of knocking the goblin unconscious, and they can interrogate it later. Our D&D party is now victorious, but they still have to make sure the fighter doesn't die, and we'll get to that in a second. Next is our wizard, who really wants to take out this goblin warrior, who is very annoying. He's considering casting Magic Missile, which never misses and has a 120 foot range. Most spells, many spells, are 30 feet only. And if he spends all three actions, he can fire a total of three missiles and determine who they hit. But he feels it's a little excessive given that this fight is probably won at this point, and he only has so many prepared first level spells. So he's going to cast a cantrip. He's going to cast Acid Splash against this goblin here. He could do that right now because it is behind the cleric, it's going to benefit from a lesser cover, which gives it a plus one circumstance bonus to its armor class. He can avoid that by moving here. But he figures he might do something that will help the entire party too, and I also want to demonstrate this rule, by debuffing it with the demoralize action. He is going to say something that is frightening to the goblin. The wizard is not trained in intimidation so likely will not succeed. Furthermore, he does not share a language with the goblin, and Demoralize says that if you don't speak in a language that they understand, you're gonna get a minus four circumstance penalty to it. However, he rolls really well, and this succeeds at frightening the goblin warrior. The frightened condition gives a status penalty to a bunch of their statistics and checks equal to the value of the frightened condition. Because this is a regular success from the wizard, it is Frightened 1. It also goes away on its own. If the goblin survives and does its next turn, its Frightened condition will lower by 1 at the end of its turn. Frightened affects everything. If this goblin were a spellcaster, the DC to avoid its spells would also go down by 1. 
Its armor class also goes down by one. All of its saving throws and attacks go down by one. Then the wizard makes his acid splash spell attack. And this will miss. And we get into a rules controversy. I will not go deep into this, but uh, it will show that not everything is cut and dry in Pathfinder. Season to taste. And in this case, it is a splash spell that only does splash damage when you hit according to the rules as written. But many GMs, like me, uh, make it work like an alchemist's splash weapon. The splash trait says you still do splash damage on a regular failure. If there's splash damage here, it would also apply to our cleric and fighter, hit all adjacent creatures. But for this demonstration, we're going to keep it alive. Our rogue must now do a recovery check, and she has to roll a 13 or higher. She fails which means she would go to dying four and she would die. However, she kept that hero point in reserve and she spends all of her hero points to immediately stabilize. And this does not increase her wounded value. Goblin number one is going to try to attack the fighter. It does not lean out. It wants to make a getaway, so it's saving its actions. So the fighter has cover, the goblin must hit a 20 and the goblin misses. With two actions left, this goblin wants to make a getaway. He could stride twice to increase the distance between himself and the party, but he sees that they do have ranged weapons on them. So he's going to try to become undetected. The goblin could do the sneak action, which lets it move half its speed and try to become undetected while doing so. However, it cannot do that yet. It has to become hidden or better first before it can attempt that. So it is going to do a hide check. It makes a stealth roll to try to hide from the party. It succeeds. With its third action, it will now try to sneak. It makes another stealth check, moves half of its speed to behind another point of cover or place of concealment, in this case behind this tree. And it succeeds on this next stealth check. So it now becomes undetected. And the party now does not know where it is and the GM tells them so. Now our D&D fighter struggles to stay alive. He has one success and one failure. He likely will need assistance from his allies. If he's still down after this roll, then the allies can try to do a medicine skill check. They'll need to get a 10 or better to do so. And if any of them bought a healer's kit for five gold, they are guaranteed to stabilize him. So there are some quite effective ways to pull someone from the brink of death in D&D. The fighter player really doesn't want this character to die, so he's going to spend his inspiration. Inspiration is a resource that you earn through good roleplay or any other reason the DM thinks of. You can have up to one inspiration point banked at a time. In 5e, if you see an important roll coming up, you say you are using your inspiration, and that gives you advantage on that roll. Here he rolls a 1 on his roll, and that would kill him. However, thankfully, he used his inspiration, and he rolls again. And the fighter rolls a 20, and that is amazing. What that means when you are doing a death saving throw is that you immediately go to one hit point, and you become conscious again. And he doesn't care that this goblin's knocked out. He's going to stand up, which uses half of his movement. He uses his bonus action as a fighter to get 1d10 plus his level in hit points back. You move half of his speed right here, interact to take out his javelin and throw it at that goblin. Now the goblin is prone, so this attack will have disadvantage, it's a ranged attack, will have disadvantage against it, and it has cover. But who knows, it may hit. And the fighter hits! However, he only does four damage to the goblin, and the goblin is now conscious. Now, rules as written, I think the goblin can only act after all of these other party members act, because they're next in the initiative. However, there are DMs that will say it can act immediately. I know I allow that in my Pathfinder games if it's been more than one round since they last took actions. Now, this is where either the rules are a bit murky or my knowledge is not as good as I want it to be. But let's say the goblin wants to get do the same thing as the Pathfinder goblin and wants to sneak away. It can do the hide action whether it reveals itself when it leaves that cover is up for interpretation. From that point, it gets a little murky. One part of the book 
says that if you were to come out of hiding and approach a creature, the creature can see you. But this person's trying to get away from the party. And because of the foliage, Anadema will probably say, well, they succeeded on that stealth check, so they are still hidden. The D&D rogue is next, and wants to find that goblin, she's going to walk forward 25 feet. Before going forward, she picks up that short sword and do the search action. Here the text for search is pretty open-ended, and this DM says, yes, you can try to find a hiding creature with it, and asks for a perception check and can set a number of DCs for the rogue to try to achieve. Maybe the DM wrote down the stealth roll from earlier, and that is the DC. Or we'll do a stealth check for the goblin right now. The rogue only has a plus zero perception. Remember, she's not trained in this skill. But she does succeed, and she tells the other players where the goblin is. She would love to fire at the goblin. However, searching was her action. So she cannot make an attack, which is an action. And she only has one action. The cleric, now knowing where it is, is going to move right here <laughs> and cast Sacred Flame. I'm just doing this to emphasize how many spells have quite a long range. This spell has a 60 foot range. So this cleric can do it from here. The goblin fails its dexterity save and takes the damage and dies. We return to our Pathfinder party. Here in Pathfinder, to try to find this hiding goblin, she can also do what's called Seek. However, it only uses one of her three actions. Also, the rule says specifically how much of an area she can seek. Either a 30-foot cone from herself or a 15-foot burst that is within line of sight, which is this big. She's guessing that that goblin did not go far, so she is going to aim right here tell the GM she is seeking, and the GM will secretly roll a perception check behind the GM screen, because the seek action, as you can see, has the secret tag. This is compared to what's called the stealth DC of the goblin, which simply consists of taking the bonus for the skill and adding 10 to it. This using a skill to determine a DC for that same skill when someone else targets it is ubiquitous throughout Pathfinder and it means you don't have to do opposed rolls. Because the goblin's stealth is plus five, the cleric needs to get a 17 on this check because remember, this goblin is benefiting from cover. And the cleric, being wise, is gonna be pretty good at seeking, and she succeeds. She has two actions left, and this goblin goes from being undetected to hidden from her. Well, remember that undetected means you don't know where it is, Hidden means you do know where it is, but you cannot see it, you do not observe it clearly. So she can target effects on this goblin, but she is going to have a 50-50 chance in failing to target it. Now, if she had critically succeeded, then the goblin would become observed to her. She has two actions left, and she has no attack spells that can reach this goblin, because spell distances tend to be shorter. Many spell distances are only 30 feet in Pathfinder, and this goblin is 60 feet away. So what she does is she points it out to her allies, which also has rules. When something is undetected to her allies, she can point it out to them. So long as her allies can see her and are in a position to detect the location of the target, she can point it out to all of her allies with this action. This effectively saves time for the fighter and the wizard who do not have to seek for it themselves. However, this probably would have been free for a character in D&D. &D. A DM would probably just say, you point it out to your party members. With the last action, she's going to bonk that goblin with her scimitar. She has her bless spell, and she misses. However, she's had it with this fight. She wants it to be over now. So she's going to spend her hero point. She rolls again, and she hits the goblin this time, and the goblin dies. Next is our fighter. He now knows where this goblin is because the cleric pointed it out to him. He can fire his short bow, certainly, and because it is hidden to him, he will need to do a flat check, roll a d20, and get an 11 or higher on that roll in order to succeed at targeting it. Note that the hidden condition also works against allies, too. If, for example, you don't have dark vision and your ally tells you where they are and you wants to heal them, now he could do that. Uh, but he has a better idea. He is going to stride three times 
to get in the goblin's face. And because the goblin no longer is behind cover, we will assume that the fighter can now directly observe the goblin. And because the fighter has attack of opportunity, this goblin is kind of pinned. Assuming that it, there is some regular terrain around it, it could step and then try to get away again, but it can't really become undetected again without risking an attack of opportunity to get far enough away to hide and sneak again. This goblin, if it knows what's good for it, is going to surrender uh, on its next turn, and that's if it survives what the wizard is going to try to do to it. We now return to our wizard, so he's going to stride actually three times to get very close to the goblin, just in case it tries to bolt away. Getting closer here matters, because even if the goblin were to bolt away and avoid an attack of opportunity from the fighter, the difficult terrain that's in this forest likely would, would keep it within the wizard's range. How? The wizard has a feat called Reach Spell. This is how metamagic works in Pathfinder. Any spellcaster can take feats that let them apply enhancements to their spell. However, it costs one action to set it up, and it increases the range of the next spell he casts by 30 feet. So this goblin can try to trudge through the forest, but the wizard can cast Electric Arc or Acid Splash. Also, Magic Missile at a 120 foot range if he wants to spell that. Next, our rogue is already stabilized, so it's no longer in initiative, and our goblin is going to try to uh, make a break for it. Our fighter makes an attack of opportunity. He's holding a short bow, but he's going to use his fist, and he hits. He does 1d4 plus 4 damage because of his strength. And this does enough damage to knock out the goblin because fists do non-lethal damage in Pathfinder. Now that both fights are over, they can both recover. And recovery is done differently in both systems. I'll just go over this briefly. In D&D, they can do what's called a short rest, which takes one hour and they have to not do anything strenuous during that time. To get hit points back, you have to spend hit dice, which are a daily resource. You have a number of hit dice equal to your level. So at level one, you have one. You declare how many hit dice you're spending before doing a short rest and you recover that number of hit dice back, you roll the hit dice, and for each hit die you add your constitution modifier as well. Also characters who have resources that recharge on a short rest, like the fighter's second wind, also get back to them. And wizards have an ability called arcane recovery to get back some expended spell slots. They can do this once per day. What Pathfinder does is it calls this exploration mode, and there are activities that take 10 minutes to complete. Anyone familiar with old school D&D will recognize the turn, which lasted 10 minutes in old school D&D. And with these 10 minute increments, players can use the treat wounds activity. If you have enough time, you can restore your party members to full health using the medicine skill and a healer's kit. Kyra, our cleric, has the medicine skill and can spend 10 minutes treating, in this case, the rogue, and she needs a 15 or higher on this medicine check. If she succeeds, she restores 2d8 hit points to the rogue. That increases to 4d8 on a critical success, and if you critically fail, it deals damage, slashing damage. Another great benefit is that you can remove the wounded condition. That can go away if you successfully treat wounds. However, there is a cooldown to treat wounds. The rogue can have treat wounds attempted on her only once every hour. The other way to get rid of it is to be at full health and to rest for 10 minutes. In D&D, they were using a finite resource to heal, and in Pathfinder, they can theoretically get to full health multiple times during the day. Also, our fighter can use his craft skill to try to repair his shield, restoring five hit points on a success. So that's the same combat in D&D and Pathfinder. I try to be as indifferent and objective as possible when presenting and comparing the mechanics of the two systems. Would love to see what people think uh, from these side-by-side -side comparisons, whether you prefer one mechanic over the other. Of course, be friendly and respectful to each other in the comment sections. In the meantime, I want to give a kind of bird's eye view comparing the two systems based off of what is shown in this demonstration. But I think I will save that for a part two of this third law school course 
So if you've liked what you've seen so far, please like and subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified when the next video comes out. You might be interested in my second law school video where I go into the design decisions that Pathfinder 2nd Edition makes and the problems it's trying to address in 3rd Edition D&D slash 1st Edition Pathfinder. So that's it. I've been the Rules Lawyer and I will see you next time. Thank you.